Amen. God bless everybody. Uh, this is Christian Ruiz here with uh, getting ready to start um, the Bible study tonight. So we're a church so that, you know, if more people come, you know, you're welcome. Um, we don't really have a, a big limit here, but at our house we would. So that's why we're here. Let us know. Send us a message in case you can hear or in case, you know, uh, there's any technical difficulties. Okay. So the people that are here, God bless you. And then whoever shows up more, you know, um, Let's get started tonight. Amen. So let's start with a prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We ask you to bless us tonight with your word, with this Bible study, Lord, that uh, bless my life. But I, I, I ask you, Lord, to allow me to transmit it so that it can bless other people as well. Thank you, Lord, for living, uh, for leaving your word for us, Lord, to be able to, uh, to take strength from it, to be able, Lord, to to use it as, as a weapon that you've left for us, Lord. Uh, we ask you, Lord, that your word be opened up to us today through your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, God bless everybody. Today, we are going to talk about um, First Book of Kings, chapter 17. Um, this is the introduction of Elijah into, um, into the Bible. This is where we see him come in. And um, as I remind you uh, last time when we studied, um, I always thought of Elijah as there's this Elijah and then there's this Jezebel that comes against him. That's always how I had it in my mind. But, you know, when you look a little closer, you realize that Jezebel is introduced first, you know. And, um, and Elijah, you know, comes, you know, a few chapters or a chapter or two later. And, um, you know, God spoke to me. It's something that, that God said. And he says he, he raises his servants with a purpose, you know. Uh, Elijah had a purpose. He, he was raised by God in a very difficult time in Israel. And, and his purpose was so strong in, in God that you see him throughout the scripture in the New Testament as well. And we come to see Elijah really as something um, of, a, of a prophet that is uh, one of the major prophets and, and that God uses him in amazing ways, right? And we also see that he's a prophet of God that gives what he receives and that's so important for us as christians to be able to give what we receive amen um and so tonight we're gonna look at him um a little bit closely um but i want you to see something really quick i want you to uh look at the title for today smelting shop and you know i guess i'm not gonna ask who knows what a smelting shop is but uh, i'll just tell you what it is so smelting shop or, or smelting the process of smelting is when you take what they call ore, which is uh, really a bunch of, um, hey, God bless you. Smelting is a process by which they remove metals um, from uh, a mixture of many kinds of compounds and, and minerals. And so when you have ore, it's like uh, this dirty looking rock-like thing. And you have to process it in order to get that metal, that valuable metal that you're looking for from there and, and this process is is is, is uh, it's like a furnace process it has a lot of a very high temperature and it uses air or oxygen they put into the system god bless everybody welcome we're just starting so haven't missed anything we're talking about elijah tonight and uh something that i called in this smelting shop and i'm kind of going over what smelting means uh it's a process that uses heat oxygen to uh remove these metals, these precious metals, and kind of clean them and process them, okay? So I didn't have a chance to put a video of it, but have you guys ever seen these furnaces that turn red hot and they blow air into them and then they pour out liquid metal from them? Have you guys seen that? Well, that's a, that's a smelting shop. Where they do that, that's what they call it. It's a smelting shop. And it's, it's a very um, high um, temperature process and it's a, it's a difficult process. But the, but the point of it is to get something valuable out of something that's dirty, that has impurities in it, that's mixed with other stuff. And finally, you, you end up getting this metal that you can use for things and that it's pure and that you can continue to process it to build things with metals. And it's, it's just incredible. So why, am I, why do I call it this? You guys remember that Elijah, so let's get into it, smelting, the extraction of metal from its ore, by a process involving heating and melting, okay? That's what it is, it's a hard process, okay? So you guys can probably see where I'm going. 
So let's, 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 uh, I'll tell you why a little bit later, why I call this, this study that. But let's get introduced into Elijah. Let's see. First book of Kings, chapter 17, the first four verses say this. Now Elijah, the Tishbite, from the Gilead settlers, said to Ahab. You guys remember last time we talked about all these kings, right? Ahab is the son of Omri, which was this guy who built Samaria, right? And this guy who built, you know, the kingdom of Israel in the north. He, kind of, he was a good, a good builder. He was a bad king, a bad man, you know? He had no desire to follow God. But he was a builder. He was a doer. And during his time, there was prosperity in the kingdom of Israel. And he passed the kingdom to his son, Ahab who married Jezebel, and we know their story, right? Ahab was worse than his dad in terms of morality, and he wasn't as really as, as you know, as, as a doer as his father was, but he still managed to pass the kingship down to his son for four generations, so, okay? So this is what God raises Elijah to bring this word. I was telling them before you guys came, I was saying, I always thought that, you know, uh, Jezebel had been kind of raised by the enemy to go fight against Elijah, and yes, she was. But Jezebel is introduced first in the Bible, and so one of the things that, uh, that, I, that I received, you know, that I understood, was that Elijah was raised with a purpose, you know? He, he, he was raised with this purpose to go against everything that Jezebel and, and Ahab represented, all that Samaria, Samaritan... Um, Idol, uh, idol worship. You guys understand what I'm saying, right? So, God raises this prophet and he says, As the Lord God of Israel lives, in whose presence I stand, there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Now God telling him, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide at the Wadi Cherith, where enters the Jordan. This is like a like a river bank, where it enters the Jordan, which is a larger river, you are to drink from the wadi. You say, I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So this is how this prophet, this amazing man of God is introduced to us. All right. We've already been introduced into Ahab and Jezebel and into what they were doing. What were they doing? They were building a city of idolatry. They were building a city that had completely left behind um, the following of the real and true God of Israel, you know. And so they represented all that, all that filth that they had built. Yes, it was a strong city, and yes, it was, uh, it was uh, prosperous, but it was far from God. And the way God saw them, they were, they were a heap of trash, if you will, you know, compared to a... Um, something like Jericho or something, right? Where they were like people that were not uh, doing things that God um, had really allowed them to do or, or that, that, that que le agradaban a Dios, you know? And so God brings up this man and he tells him to give this harsh word. And he says, there will be no rain until I say again that there will be rain. And then, interestingly enough, God sends him into hiding. And let me, let's, let's, let's look at that a little bit. First of all, a few things that I want to raise. First, God raises Elijah to counter this movement of the enemy in Israel. Okay? God raises him to go against the current. Okay? Everything that Elijah does is always against what's happening in, 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 the, in, in that society, in El Pueblo. He's, he was raised to go against the current. And that's interesting because... Because if we don't see ourselves as going against the current, then we're not, we're not see, we're not really, we might be um, going with the current. And we got to ask ourselves if we truly are like Elijah, a man going against the current, you know. Keep that in mind. Baal worship, Jezebel. Another thing that I want to keep, in, I want to raise up to you guys. He says the God of Israel. What's, what's happening to the Israelites at that point? They're not only just worshiping Baal in a passive way. They're building temples for Baal at this point, all right? It's not like before when you remember Jeroboam, he put temp he was like, oh yeah, worship these guys, you know, worship this, this, uh, this golden calves, you know? Uh, now it's, it's real, it's like temple. There's gonna be a temple for Baal. And, and Baal was the god of, of the storm. This was supposed to be the god that control the rain. You know that? It's interesting because 
because um, Baal was supposed to be the God that could control the rain. And so God goes against Baal through Elijah. And he says, okay, you think you can control the rain, right? Okay, well, I will stop the rain and see if you Baal can give you a rain back, right? And so this is the kind of the play of powers that's happening at this point. So the first thing Elijah does is he recognizes the God of Israel, okay? Second, in whose presence I stand. And so this is a famous line, you know, God of Israel, as, as, as the God of Israel lives, in whose presence I stand. Why is that important? Because Elijah was, like I said, going against the current. And he needed to know that he was before God, that God was backing him up. Because if he wasn't, he was going to end up dead like all the other prophets. Now, sometimes we don't think about it, right? But prophets have been murdered by Jezebel, right? He wasn't, other prophets, other men of God had been murdered, had been killed in this place, in this time, okay? So for him to be like, to come up and have this word against Ahab, he, need to, he needed to know, hey, God, I'm in your presence, you know? Because if I'm not in your presence and I'm just talking, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make it, right? So those words are very, very important to, to Elijah. So he goes and he becomes so important, guys. And let's, let's put this in, into perspective, right? You guys remember when Jesus uh, goes up to the mount and he is transfigured before uh, some of the disciples? Who's there with him? Elijah is one of them, right? Who else? And Moses and, and Jesus talking. Uh, I believe they're talking about when Jesus will be taken, you know. Uh, let's study that, okay? But, but I want you to understand this man and what significance he has as a prophet that he's in that, in that place and time with Jesus, with Moses. What did Moses represent? The law, right? The law that was given to Moses. And, and I think Elijah represents this, the prophets, you know, in general, the word that had been given by the prophets to Israel for so much, you know, it could have been Isaiah, it could have been someone else, right? So many great prophets. But it was Elijah, you know? And so the way I see it, they come together with Jesus, because what's Jesus going to do, right? Jesus, he didn't come to abolish the law, right? Or to abolish what the prophets had spoken. He came to cumplirlo, right? And not only that, but he becomes the prophet. He becomes... You know, the, the, now it's through grace, right? And it changes everything. And there's a new, and, and now Jesus is the one who takes what these men represent. And, he, and it's Jesus who, who is now the, the, the center. You guys understand that, right? Before Israel was like, oh, the law of Moses, the law. Now it's like, well, now Jesus has spoken, right? And what happens in that, in that time when Peter says, oh, man, let's stay here. You know, let's make enramadas and let's, let's stay here. What, what, is, what does God's voice say? This is my son. Jesus, to him, listen, listen to him. And that's important because Moses is there and Elijah's there and God's voice says, now listen to Jesus. And okay, that's an important thing to understand, but understand that Elijah was there and it's significant, okay? All right, God sends him to hide alone. We're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about this today because remember the, the, the title of the uh, this study, right? is the smeltering, the smelting shop, right? Um, it's a process that's not going to be easy. So God is raising Elijah to do something incredible, amazing, great, you know? But before he can do all those things, he has to be processed. And we've talked about this a lot in, in Pulse, right? About God's process. We see a Jacob. We see everybody that God wants to use has to go through a process from God, right? And we're going to see that Elijah is no exception, okay? So God sends him to this place to this riverbank, right, that is about, that it's, that it's uh, about to dry up, first of all. And God sends him there to hide and to be alone, right? And it's important to understand this. This is the first concept we, we want to study tonight, you know, that loneliness. If you guys study um, Elijah, right, you realize that he felt alone. I had always read this verse about when Elijah says, you know, only I remain, Right? You guys remember when he says that? You know, they've killed the prophets, you know, that were faithful, and, and only I remain. And I always thought kind of that like that was kind of like conceited, kind of like, oh, ya solo quedo yo, you know, like I'm the last Coca Cola en el desierto, right? 
You guys understand? That's how I, I always kind of saw it that way, you know? I don't know why, to be honest with you. I just kind of read it that way. But then I understood the loneliness that he also felt. That he was fighting this thing almost alone. Like he had no people around him, you know, to say. And God has to remind him, hey, by the way, you're not alone. There's a lot of others that haven't bowed to Baal. And so it's, it's beautiful. But, but I see um, Elijah kind of struggling with this loneliness, you know. And so he's here in this place. God sends him to be alone so that God can do something in him, okay? And we'll see a little bit of what that is. And then God sends ravens to provide for him. You know, let's see what happens. Look at this. So he proceeded to do what the Lord commanded. Elijah left and lived at the wadi, Sherith, where it enters the Jordan. By the way, this word, Sherith, right here, it's, a, it's like a cut. It means cut. It's the same word as, as you used to. Look it up, whoever has the, the, um, the Bible. ¿Cómo se dice? Los... Um, yeah, so look, look up that word. It means cut, right? And it's interesting because to, the way I see it is like there are certain things that God wanted. One thing, God wanted to cut him away from everybody, okay? Sends him alone. Be by yourself. You need to be by yourself right now. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to do some things that you wouldn't otherwise do. Listen to this. So he sends him there where it enters the Jordan. And then the ravens kept bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening and he would drink from the wadi. Okay? After a while, what happens though, the wadi dries up because there had been no rain in the land. Number one thing I'll point out a little bit to start with. You guys remember the Israelites, uh, what did they consider ravens to be? They were unclean animals, right? By the law of Moses and everything, they shouldn't be touching your food, you know? And this, is, and this is something so simple, right? That seems kind of like, oh, you know. But honestly, right, you wonder, why did God use ravens to go feed his, his servant? He has them in this place. He's alone. He's probably scared because other prophets have been killed. Um, and he has just brought this word to Ahab that, that's, that's tough, that's rough, that is, uh, you know. And, 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 and now he's hiding in this place. And this unclean animals are bringing him his food you know, so I just want you for a second to kind of put let's put our let's put ourselves in, in, in Elijah's shoes for a minute right and try to understand him going through this through this process right and then not only that but the place that he's drinking water from dries up and what does it dry up because of the word that he gave he gave it dries up because there's no rain it says right there it's, it's directly related to God's process. And that's, this is where I, I want to I wanna stop. First of all, the raven thing, right? You know, this, this kind of like letting go of your, how could I, how could I say? Letting go of, of um, yes, and, and even the, in this case, the law. He wasn't really, he wasn't supposed to eat stuff. Clearly, he wasn't eating the ravens, but but he wasn't, he, you know, this was unclean animals. The whole, the whole concept of unclean is if this is unclean, right? This hand is not clean. This one's clean, right? And I touched this hand. Now this hand is not clean. That's, that's really the concept of, of unclean in the Bible. You guys study it. It was this contact. Had, had, there was a problem with contact, right? If something was unclean, you shouldn't touch it. If a dead person, you shouldn't touch it because it's unclean and you have to get ceremonially cleansed, etc. But, but the point is that this dirty animal, unclean animal, is bringing you your food. Right? But it's because the Lord decided it that way. And so one of the first things that, that Elijah, you guys start to understand about him, is he has to understand that, that it's no longer about my expectations. It's no longer about the law, including. It's just... I'm going to follow what God's telling me to do right now. Go to that place. I'll go to that place. Take the food from this animal. I'll take the food from this animal. And it's part of the process that he's going through, right? And then what else? The wadi dries up, right? And I imagine he must have thought about, well, it dried up because I prayed that there's no, no rain. It dried up because it's God's plan to, for it to dry up. If, I, what did he say when he, when he says that the, the rain's going to stop? When is the rain coming back? Until he gives the word. Who gives the word? Elijah. Elijah. It, it doesn't say until God. I, I, obviously, God gives him that authority. 
he does it other times too, where he gives this word, but he, you know, God, it's not God telling him say this or something. I'm not saying that it was, I think God backs him up, right? But it's interesting to say that he says, it's not going to rain until I says it rains again, right? And then, kind of people I don't think he talks about people I mean um, um, and you know I'll just try to touch on it real quick um, you remember Peter Peter later on right Peter says um, you know he's very much like the Jews only kind of camp if you will right and Paul is like no let's open up the thing to everybody so everybody gets this, you know, grace, salvation by grace message, right? It's for everybody. And then, and then Peter is like, no, it's, you know, the Jews, and they should get circumcised. And, and he's very like that, right? He's very, like, uh, thinking about the law, right? And, and, what, is, and what, what happens to him, right? One night he has this dream of this apparition where he starts seeing unclean animals. And there's a voice that tells him, kill and eat. And then he's like, oh, Nothing dirty has ever c come into my mouth. And what does God say to him? He's like, don't say something is undirty when I've already cleansed it. Right? So for that person who asked that, it's not so much about the people, people or what they represent. Um, God had given guidelines to the Israelites about what kind of animals they could eat. Some of them were health related. Others were, I'm sure, just obedience. Can you obey? You know? um, and others, yes, they do represent. Uh, ravens, for example, do, can represent bad spirits and demons and things like that, um, like frogs and other animals in the Bible. Yeah, you can see that there's this uh, metaphorical representation of something evil. Uh, ravens do in the Bible, more so than people, I think. Uh, but, but it's a good question because you'll see where God sends him later in a few... In a few uh, actually, there's a comparison. Let me just say it right now since I'm going to get there eventually. Right now, there's a raven giving him his food, right? Later on, a few chapters, a few slides down, is going to be a, a widow giving him his food. Who is that widow and where she's from is important because she's a Sidonian. That is where Jezebel's from. She's not an Israelite. And Jesus much later remembers that episode and says, you know, there were so many widows in Israel, but I didn't send Elijah to, her, to any of those widows. I sent them to a Sidonian woman who was a widow, all right? And if you think about it, that Sidonian woman was, uh, was not an Israelite. She was also considered to be unclean, if you will. So the question is kind of related, okay? And it's a, it's a good point. Okay, so but one of the things I want to point out, right, is that the rain stopped because of the word he gave. And he doesn't solve this problem by just saying, you know what? When I said no rain, I need water right now. So how about this? Let's just stop this test, you know. Uh, I was thinking about what this button was, you know, when you, when you go into a, what do you call it? Into a challenge, right? You guys seen it where if at some point you realize that the challenge is too hard, you, you have an option to quit, right? Escape button. button, escape button. So Navy SEALs, when they're training, I've, I've heard that, you know, they don't, they don't die if they can't take it anymore. They can just quit. At some point, you're like, you know what, this process is a little more than I thought it was. I thought I was Navy SEAL material, but it turns out I'm not. So you go, and I was watching a documentary on it once, actually, that's why, and there's these bells that they have. And they go and they ring the bell to say that they quit. And they're fine, and they can go and they can eat and they can rest and they can put something warm on because they were you know, doing drills in the, in, the, in the middle of the freezing water, whatever they were doing that made them quit in that moment. And it's a real thing. And I, I was thinking as I was reading this about Elijah saying, man, I'm going to die of thirst, right? Because the word that I gave, now it's affecting me because this thing dried up because of the word that I gave. But I also said that it's going to rain again when I give the word. You guys understand what I'm saying? Right? And so in a way, he chooses to stick to the plan, to stick to God's plan. And I think that's, that's interesting to note because... Because the, 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 the rain had stopped, therefore the wadi dried up, therefore he didn't have any more drinking water. And the solution was that he would just say, let it rain again, right? That's because I need the water now, right? But he doesn't. He continues with God's process. And a lot of times, that's how it is in, in God's process. I think God lets us quit sometimes, his process. And we get out of it, you know? But eventually, we're going to have to go through it again. 
You guys understand what I'm saying? You guys ever felt like Peter? Yes, it's a good example. What do you mean by Peter? Just in case we're not thinking about the same example. Yeah. So Peter, he gives up when uh, Jesus dies on the cross. He he negates him and he says, "I give up. I don't know this person." Yeah, this is too hard, right? This, this is, is too hard. Than I thought, yeah. Right. I don't have my leader anymore. I give up. Yeah, yeah. And then Jesus has to come and restore, and we've studied that so much, right? And there's other people in the Bible that also give up in the middle of the process. Yeah, Jonah. Jonah, and he has to go through it again until eventually, eventually, God's purpose is, is more than our than our than our will, you know, unwillingness to go through the process. But he makes it longer, and so here Samson. we see Samson. Okay, <laughs> here we see God's God's plan and purpose continue because this man stuck to the process that he was going through. You understand? Amen. Let me know if I'm not being clear at any point. So. God sends him to somewhere else now. So he's at the wadi. The wadi dries up. The ravens are feeding him, right? Also note this. This is interesting. I'm just, just throwing it out there. So much of this story is about where his provision comes from. You know? I was just kind of interested by that. Right? He's over there. And then the ravens are going to feed you. And then this, the, the, the water is right there. There's a source of food. There's a source of... of right? And now... We go again, and it's the same thing. How am I going to provide for you? So we got to pay attention to that. So verse 8 through 10 says this, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Get up, go to uh, Zarephath, Zarephath, that belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Look, I have commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. So Elijah got up and went to Zarephath. When he arrived at the city gate, there was a widow gathering wood. Elijah called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup and let me drink. Ser- Seraphath means smelting shop. And that, that's, why I, that's why I named this study this. Okay? God sends him to this place um, that is supposed to be a place where he's going to be processed. You know? And... Um, one of, the, one of the first things that I note already is that this woman is not an Israelite. She's from a place belonging to Sidon, which is where Jezebel's from, who's brought all this contamination into Israel. And uh, we see a similar story with Jonah. Jonah, I think, is the Assyrians, if I'm not mistaken, that were the Ninevites. They were Assyrians. They had done so much to hurt the people of God so when God sends him to Nineveh, what does he say? He's like, no. Why am I going to bless those people? Why am I going to be a blessing to the people that hurt my people? Why am I going to be a blessing to the Sidonians? Why am I going to go to that place where, you know, like those Jezebel's people, you know? I'm not going to do that, right? And so that's one part of the process too. Just being humble and being able to even bless those that hurt you or that represent or this among those that hurt you, you know? And we see that um, he goes, you know, he listens to, to, to God's word. Um, and when he arrives, and it's interesting because if you guys see the story, God says, you know, I have commanded her to feed you. And when he asks her for food, she has no idea. Nobody ever told her anything, right? She doesn't even have food, actually, right? And so that's, that's interesting, right? Be- because God tells him, I've, I've already commanded her. And, and so in that way, we see God's um, sovereignty, right? That, um, that God had already determined that this woman was going to be the one to provide him, you know? And so that's, that's interesting, too. And, and here is what I was talking about earlier. Look, this is Jesus. Um, you guys remember, this is early in, in Jesus' um, uh, ministry, that he brings up this thing that we're studying tonight, right? Um, he's, um, he's just ha- come out of this temptation. Do you remember? It's in the same chapter, early, first part of the chapter. He goes to the desert. He's tempted by the enemy. He's victorious. And then when he comes out, he goes to the temple and he reads. Uh, and, and, but one of the interesting things is that he goes to the place where he was born, to, Na- uh, to um he is in uh, Nazareth. Uh, look it up. Can somebody look it up? Uh, Luke 4, 24. 
and, and, and this is the whole point that he's, that he's telling them, you know, because um, people are starting to say, isn't that, isn't that Joseph's son? You know, because he starts to become well-known, you know. He, it's early in his ministry. People start hearing about Jesus and Jesus and Jesus this, and he's talking all this wisdom and he's, um, you know, and, and so uh, Jesus of Nazareth, right? And so people start to say, well, isn't that Jesus? That's Joseph's son, right? What's so special about him? His dad's a carpenter. And so Jesus says this, Look, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's days when the sky was shut up for three years and six months while a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow of Seraphath in Sidon. Right? And so that's, one, that's another interesting thing that Jesus is talking about. He's comparing that, um, that rejection that he feels in his own hometown, right? He says no prophet is accepted in his hometown, right? And then he brings back to the, what we're studying right now about Elijah um, being in a place outside of Israel, blessing someone who's not even part of, 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 uh, of Israel's uh, people. And um, that, you know... That ability to not uh, to 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 face that rejection. I think we talked about it uh, with Samuel, right? Remember Samuel, how people reject him. They're like, "Oh, we don't we don't want to we don't want you. We want a king, right?" And Samuel is, feels rejected, and God tells him, "Don't worry, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me, right?" So that that whole concept is here again. Okay, so look at what happens with this widow. All right. He says, as we went to, uh, to, to, as she went, so she goes to get him this water. He, he wants, so he comes, she's working because she has no food. She has nothing. And she's kind of just trying to take care of herself and her son. And he asked her for water. And as she's going to go to, uh, get in the water, he calls to her and says, please also, by the way, bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she says, as the Lord your God, your God lives, I don't have anything baked. Only a handful of flour in the jar and a bit of oil in the jug. Just now, and listen to what her, she says. She says, I am gathering a couple of sticks in order to go prepare it for myself and my son so we can eat it and die. Then Elijah says to her, don't be afraid. Go and do as I have said. But first, make me a small loaf from it and bring it out to me. Afterward, you may make some for yourself and your son. And I'll read the rest in a bit, but... That's crazy, isn't it? I mean, um, we talked about the ravens, right? And kind of like him going against this thing that he really, you know, because of the law, he shouldn't, he should have thought about it, right? If his mind was, was leading him, right? And in this case, again, if his mind was leading him, he would have thought about doing this. I would have thought about it. I wouldn't have done it. I'd be like, God, seriously, she's got no food, right? And you're asking me to ask her for the only food she has left for her and her son. How many of you guys here would have done that? No, right? Except if God tells you. Because God had already said, I have commanded her. I've already determined that she's going to provide for you. So he goes from these ravens providing for him to this woman providing for him, who's a Sidonian, who uh, later on we learned that there's some kind of... Um, uh, iniquity or some kind of sin in her life because she says it herself when her son dies later on we'll see it so this is this person is not it's definitely not the picture of like a good life you know she's poor she's dying she has nothing left um, and the very little she has left he comes and he asks for it but why because the concept then what we're trying to understand is why does he do that you know, why does he have the guts to, to do something like that, right? Sometimes, um, and this is important, you know, because later on we learn, right, you know, through that, that when you're working, there's the, the law of the spirit. You've, we've talked about this with my wife a few times, right? Where sometimes you can think about, in my own mind, what's the right thing to do? What's the right thing to do at this moment, right? And, uh, and there's laws of people and there's, you know, that tell you how to, how, to, how to behave, what to do, what not to do, right? But there's a moment in our lives as Christians that we just got to do what God tells us. Even if it seems 
I would say unfair, right? Even if it seems unclean, like the, 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 the food he receives from the ravens, right? And what's this, what's, what, what is he learning there, right? What is, he, what is God asking him to do and keeps asking him to do is to do things against what anybody would do, right? And Defy logic. To defy logic, right? He's just living this life against logic. You don't go to a widow who's about to cook her last meal for her and, and then ask them for it because it's just wrong, right? But we have to learn to listen to God's voice because he knows what he's telling us, right? And, if, you know, one of the dangers of, of just, you know, of not doing that is, is that you're not going to be living in God's will, you know? Um, and Elijah, as he said before, you know, like, as the Lord lives in whose presence I stand, his life depended on staying where God wanted him and doing what God wanted him to do. And this was part of it, okay? And so he says, you know, don't worry, make some. And then for this, this is what the Lord says. The, the flour uh, jar will not become empty and the jug will not run dry until the day that the Lord sends um, until the, until the day that the, the, the Lord sends rain on the surface of the land. And that's interesting, too, because note that um, that blessing was, wasn't going to last forever, right? It was this temporary blessing that God had given this one. It's just a, a small point I want to make, right? Um, we have to take the blessings for the time of that blessing, right? We see that this blessing was something that it was eventually going to run dry, Eventually. Yeah, Eventually it's going to end, right? But it's for now. Enjoy it now, you know? God will provide for your need right now. When it starts to rain again, you're going to have to go back and continue, you know, doing whatever. It, 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 she was obviously a working woman, right? She, she was out working when he found her, you know, looking for wood, trying to do something, right, to, to, uh, to survive. And it's interesting that God gives her that miracle, right? But it says, well, eventually it's going to end too, right? But I will continue to provide because then the rain will come and then so on and so forth. So that's interesting. And one of the things that we start to see really with this whole thing that's happening here is how God always continues to back up what Elijah does, what Elijah says, I'm sorry, right? When Elijah says it's not going to rain and it stops raining, right? And when Elijah what we see right now is when he says you know what don't worry uh, the flour and the oil will not you know you will continue to have more and more right and God does it and we'll see what happens here look at so she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah and then the woman Elijah and her household ate for many days the flour jar did not become empty and the oil jar did not run dry according to the word of the Lord uh, according to the word of the Lord spoken through Elijah. What do you guys think God is, is doing with Elijah too? I think God's building his faith because what comes next, and if you guys continue to study, um, it gets worse, right? Here is it's, it's a nice miracle. It's nice. You know, God provides, you know, in a miraculous way. First the ravens, right? Then this woman, things are good, right? Doesn't it seem that things are good, right? Uh, and that's where we see God's process because um, look what happens next. After this, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. So after God does this miracle, right? And his illness got worse until he stopped breathing. And she said to Elijah, man of God, what do you have against me? This is what I was telling you earlier. Have you come to call attention to my iniquity? So that my son is put to death. And that's interesting, you know. Um, first thing I'll point out is that it says that he got sick, right? And then he got worse. And then he got really bad. And then he died. And so one of the first things I ask myself is, why did they wait until he died? It sounds to me like, to me, like his, pro his death was not like immediate because it says he became ill. His illness got worse, right? And then he just stopped breathing. He died, right? And, um, and I find it interesting that at no point that, you know, you can go and ask for healing. It 
it's easier than asking for someone to come from the back from the dead, right? Um, and, and it's 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 just interesting. I, it caught my attention. Um, and so what happens? He said, but Elijah said to her, "Give me your son." So he took him from her arms, brought him up to the upstairs room where he was staying, and laid on uh, laid uh, him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, "Lord, may God, my God." Have you also brought a tra tragedy on the widow I am staying with by killing her son? And then, she, and then he stretched himself over the boy three times. He cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, my God, please let this boy's life come into him again. So the Lord listened to Elijah and the boy's life came back into him and he lived. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's interesting, right? Because it, this is God just listening to a man. You know, think about that, that connection that, that, that Elijah had all the time. Elijah didn't, he didn't see this coming, right? And then when it does happen, by his own words, it's, it's a little bit strange that he says, you know, um, uh, you know, have you, have you brought tragedy on this woman's life, you know? I mean, as if she wasn't suffering enough. That's kind of what Elijah tells God, right? He kind of like, como, como se puede decir? It sounds a little bit um, complaining. Right, or a little bit like, God, what, what are you doing? You know, like she was helping me, you know, and now you, this happens, you know. So, in my, in my understanding, I, I don't think he expected it. I, I think things were fine, you know. God sends me here, there's famine, but then God does this miracle, and now we're all eating, we have food, we have plenty of food. Yeah, I, I just wanted to share that, you know, that's something that I noticed too is that it got tough. Like this whole this whole time, this situation for Elijah seemed pretty tough. Even the fact that the brook dried up, you know, and he was being submitted to, to God throughout the entire time, but he didn't complain. We don't see him complain at all mm -hmm. up until this point. Oh, you know, we see him complain to God, and and my version just says, um, let's see, where he cries out to God, and he says, "Have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me?" Yeah. You know, he's saying, like, God, like, everything was going the way that you wanted it to. Uh -huh. Like, what, what's the jig? You know, what's going on? So that's one thing that I noticed. He's kind of, like, saying, like, God, if, you know, we're being submitted and we're being obedient, then why is there tragedy? Yes, you know? that's interesting. And then the second thing that I noticed is that I think this might have happened. I don't know, right? It's just what I'm seeing. But I think this might have happened also to bring uh, faith to the woman. Oh yeah, that, you'll you know, see. After he gets healed, the woman says to Elijah, "Now I know for sure. Now I know for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. That you are a man of God, and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Even after, imagine if, after if the I miracle, seen that miracle, like endless oil, endless flour. I'd be like, yeah, true. That's enough, God, right? Right. That's yeah. enough. But I guess her faith was still being restored through this process yeah. too. And even Jesus remembers, right? Yeah. Because Jesus talked about her. I mean, we, sometimes we, we, we read the Bible and we kind of like miss something, right? And this woman, right? Jesus is going to talk about her hundreds of years later, you know? And, and just put that into your heads because, because it's, it's, that, it's that important what happens here that, that Jesus talks about this, this, this scene, right? And what's happening here. And, and yes, you know, like God could have blessed so many other widows who needed God's blessing at that point in Israel, right? But God sends him to this other place, to this woman who wasn't an Israelite, to bless her, right? Uh, to bring her food during the time where she needed it. And not only that, but then to, you know, to, um, to, to give her her son back, you know? Um, you, you almost so can see it like, um, you see that she was from a people that never knew of God, right? So... If you, like, I'm trying to put it into perspective of, like, where, when you're evangelizing people that have never known anything from God, mm -hmm. they may need one to two miracles or one to two things to, like, really make the gospel, like, true for them. Like, at any moment, like, I think if you put it in today's terms, at any moment someone can provide something for me, like, oh, wow, thank you, that was amazing, right? But then you forget about it, right? But when, but to have like this amazing miracle of bringing someone back to life, it's it's bigger because you have to overcome the fact that you had no knowledge of God whatsoever, right? So you can think, oh, you know, that's magic or whatever, you know, I'm lucky or something like that with provision, right? Or I'm, you know, I just know how to make money or something. 
but then to see healing in the body that's like another level that some people need in their walk with christ to to see that right so yeah yeah the the the, the type of miracle that god exactly does in Mm -hmm. her house it's incredible and another thing i'll point out real quick is is the upper room uh, this is this is uh, there's a concept of of the upper room that kind of is, is in a way when you read this verse you, there's this woman she she has this house she's a widow but she has this room and she gives it to this prophet right and it becomes the place where the prophet lived in this upper room and uh, what does the upper room tell us about yeah. he took it upstairs right to the room where he was staying uh, have you guys heard the, the, the phrase upper room. Yeah, we, we've probably heard preachings about it, but it's an important concept for the Christian to have an upper room in your life. All right, so God brings uh, Elijah to this house where there's this upper room where he lives. And the, you know, one of the biggest miracles, actually, he performs is, is this one, actually. How, how bigger does it get, right, than to bring someone back um, from the dead? Uh, and, you know, um, and he takes his boy to the upper room. Um, we see also Peter does the same thing if you guys look i wrote it down here acts chapter 9 verse 36 there's a girl named tabitha that uh, dies um she was a good girl she was uh, everybody loved her apparently and she was amazing and she dies and peter comes and he brings her to the upper room to a secret place you know uh and uh and again she's resurrected um and kind of similar situation when jero's daughter dies and um and god comes to his house and he kicks everybody out the upper room is really a place of communion with god that's what the upper room is it's it's a place where there's no one else you know it's probably a tiny room up in the house where where elijah play, prayed and, and was in communion with god that's what the upper room represents like, yeah. like an attic like no one else fits there you know it's just you and and, and god and so that's what the upper room and so we see this, this upper room to be in a place or this 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 single room uh, being a place where you know god does this amazing miracle and we would see it more than once in the bible i immediately thought of of um, peter with tabitha resurrecting her in the upper room and then jesus with jairus daughter where there was many people in the house and jesus kicks them all out he's like get out get out of the house only the parents and me and i think john i think over it's one of his apostles um but it's it's this, this place of just it's closed up to the to the everybody else you know that's the concept of the upper room. And, and Elijah is kind of like the one who, who brings this, you know, this concept into, into the Bible. I don't know if it happens before. Is there any upper rooms uh, before? I, I don't can't know. remember. No. Either way, it's, uh, it's an important concept to, uh, to pick up as, as a Christian. So, um, all right. Let's go. We're almost uh, finishing. So we start asking ourselves, why does God bring him here? You know? So then, going to what you were saying, then Elijah took the boy, brought him down from the uh, upstairs room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, now I know you're a man of God and the Lord's word from your mouth is true. Now, let me tell you something. Um, it's true, I think, that this helped her faith. Obviously, right? All of a sudden, you know, like this amazing miracle happens in my house, you know, to me, to my, to my, in my life, you know. But what about Elijah? You know, he wasn't expecting that to happen. You know, if, if he would have been sure that, oh, God can rest, you know, if, if, if something falls, right? I know I can pick it up. If this, my, the phone falls, I know I can pick it up, right? It's a problem that I can solve really easily. If something happens that you don't know if you can solve, that's when you act like Elijah did. How can you do this, God? How can you allow this to happen? Because he didn't know what God was going to do, you know? I'm trying to kind of explain to you why it is that this is a big deal for Elijah too. Because even though, you guys remember when when Jesus, uh, um, Jairus' daughter, what does Jesus do? He's going to her house, right? Because she's sick, uh, Jairus' daughter. And this woman stops him, right? It's the woman who, who's sick. And she touches his, his robe. And she's healed. And he stops. And they takes time. And then he t- talks about it. And then the girl dies. The girl that, that he's going to go see, right? 
And people say, come to him and he says, you know, don't bother him anymore because the girl's already dead. You don't see Jesus say, oh man, oh. I lost track of time, you know? I, I'm, I'm just putting it this way, but why? Because Jesus knew that he was going to show an even greater miracle because he was going to raise her from the dead. And Jesus knew this, right? So you don't see that, you know, but we see an Elijah saying, oh God, seriously. She let me into her house. She's been feeding me. You showed her this miracle. And, and now, you know, the kid dies. And why, why is he acting like that? I connected with these final words here. Because he just didn't know what God was going to do. And he had to have faith. And when this woman says this, Now I know you are a man of God. And the Lord's word from your mouth is true. I can tell you something. Now he also knows that, that God's been preparing him to go and do something greater that's going to be much harder. And believe me, it's not that uh, everything's great for Elijah from now on. He, he will continue to go to, through his process. But this being in this place between the Wadi and, 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 uh, and uh, Seraphat, right? with this living in this house, God's building him up. You know, uh, God's working on, what is he working on? God's working in, in this lonely place. We just have to be just, you trust God. That's it. All right. Obviously, you know, uh, later on, when he has this great victory against the prophets of Baal, what happens to him? He becomes scared for his life. He runs away and he's alone again, now in a cave. And so God continues to work on this. This is not over. And as, as Christians, one, that's one thing that we have to understand, guys and girls is that God's process in our lives continues, you know? We'll continue to study maybe Elijah and, and maybe not, I don't know. But, um, but look at that. You study it yourself. This is a Bible study, but we can't study every single chapter. Um, but I invite you guys to go see that the process with Elijah is not yet finished. This was part of the process to get him ready to go and, and, um, and give harsh word and, and to do amazing things. But some of, the, some of the things God still needs to continue to work in him, you know. Um, I think he's a good example of um, everybody talk, when to talk about depression. Elijah is one of the people that they use as an example. He, he was actually saying, God, I, I don't want to be alive anymore. Uh, he does that. After having gone through this, and after having gone through even greater victories, um, he's depressed. He wants to sleep all the time. Hey, guys. Uh, one of the things about depression, right, is that people want to sleep. Uh, have you guys heard about that? Yeah. People are depressed. They just want to sleep all the time. And Elijah is like that. He's just sleeping. He just goes and he's depressed and he's like, uh, and then, you know, God keeps waking him up and tell him, hey, eat, you know, and he eats and then he's like, okay, I'm going to go back to sleep. You know, it's incredible because, and, and actually it's, um, it's James, if somebody can help me find it, that says, oh, I don't know if I put it here. No, I didn't. James says, wasn't Elijah just like us? When he did, okay, somebody's got to find it. I, I got to find it now. Um, James talks about, can somebody Google it? James, when he, James mentions Elijah. And then tell me what he says about him. Because what, what he says is, isn't Elijah just like all of us? That's, that's, that's what he's trying to say. You know? and, and, and didn't he do this or that? Are you still looking for it? Um, oh, yeah, I can look this one. I think I saw it earlier. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is, uh, who, who did I say? James, right? Look at this. Five seventeen. Yeah, Read it. it. Says Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly ah. that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Yeah. So, so what? What James and you guys remember? James was very wise, right? And and James is just saying that what we're what we're kind of saying too. You know, he could have said something else, uh, but what, what does he mean when he says, "Wasn't Elijah just like one of us"? You know, and yet what he did, 
because God spoke through him. You know, it's incredible, right? And what does that tell us? He tells us that we could do the same thing. As a matter of fact, he tells us that we should do the same thing. You know, that we should be those people going against the current, that we should be those people that um, can be alone in God's process, that we should be those people that don't quit the process. It's, um, Okay, that we can be those people that, uh, that just believe God. You don't see, you don't, you don't say, is this logical? Is this appropriate? Right? Um, one of the things, you know, that, uh, that we live in, in a world where it's, it's, um, it's going in a direction, right? And a lot of t- um, we're going in the opposite direction, right? And, um, and in order to really be like, like uh, I think Elijah understood that he had to be in God's presence, in whose presence I stand, if he was going to be able to do that, to do God's, God's work and to, you know, that's why Elijah always kind of just listens to what God's, God's telling him. There's a few times where he doesn't, but um, we'll study that maybe in the future. Uh, what's coming after this is, is really tough, you know? And so going through this process is where Elijah kind of comes to kind of be that in the smelting shop. You know, God just processing him, you know. Um, what else? Uh, oh, yes, and important to just reiterate, I guess, the importance of Elijah, you know, and, and what, um, what uh, you know, how, how he appears with Jesus and, and the whole concept of, uh, of the transfiguration and, and um, why Elijah was there, why not someone else. Um, so that's, that's what I, you know, had in, to share tonight. Yep, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was afraid you get into that, but that's, no, no, that's, no, that's no, very deep, saying, actually. So but kind of like, um, I guess that ties into how Elijah brings back mm-hmm. or, or brings faith to like the, the Israelites, right, the Jewish people, in, in kind of like the same way that he did when he asked God to bring fire down, kind of like in that same way, but now with the uh, Israelites yeah. of today. So, right? so, what, so that's where we, we see Elijah, right, um, being so um, so critical in this time and place, right? What was happening in that place where, he, where God brings him up? Samaria, the middle of God's people, right? Remember, this is God's people. This is not, uh, you know, Canaanites or something. These are, these are Israelites. And, and God brings him into this place. Um, and the, the, the biggest blessing, if you think about it, comes to this, um, this woman, you know? I'm not an Israelite. Uh, but why is that? Because the people of Israel were so far away by that point. And if you see, if you continue read, reading ahead, right, one of the things that, um, that Elijah is um, fighting against is double-mindedness. Just that, like, what are you? Are you, are you? Do you believe in God or do you believe in Baal? Because that's the struggle in Israel at that time. And that's the first thing he tells the Israelites when he finally challenges them, uh, challenges the, the prophets of Baal, he tells Israel, he's like, make up your minds. You can't have it both ways. You can't be Israelites that believe in God and also live the way that you're living. You know? And that's what really, that's what Elijah was, was struggling against in his, in his ministry. God had brought him, raised him to fight against this, this, um, this double-mindedness. You know? And isn't that what we what we're living today, you know. Um, people want to have it both ways, right? Um, and yes, you know, the, they even talk about comparing Elijah to um, John the Baptist, who came to right before Jesus, right, to prepare, um, to pre- in, in a kind of like a spiritual way, preparing the, the way for Jesus. Um, and so, you know, they compare it to, to Elijah, right? And the spirit of Elijah, what is it? What is it Gonna, what is it going to do? What does the Bible says it's going to do? Yeah, it's it's a it's a spirit of reconciliation, right? Which is a, what needs to happen before before we go to the next, you know, the rapture and all these things, you know. Um, amen. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and, and to the point where even Jesus remembers that this woman was blessed by Elijah, you know, not being an Israelite. Um, amen. So, um, if you guys don't have any more questions, that's, that's, that was the study for today. I, I, you know, I remind you guys, these are Bible studies. And so, um, there's a lot more, you know. We could spend, we could just keep going, you know. Because what we're doing a lot is we're just reading and, and picking up all the, these beautiful things from it, right? We can continue reading the next chapter and it's more amazing things. Um, one of the things that I'll just mention, you know, that I was thinking about today is when Elijah uh, makes the... The, um, the altar, when he puts the, he says, he comes to the prophets of Baal, 400, I think, of them or something. It's, it's a few hundred of them. And he tells them, okay, build your altar and I'll build mine. And then the God that sends fire, that's, that's the real God, right? Uh, and then they do that. But one of the things he does is that he pours water over the altar many times. I forget how many times, you know. And, um, and I was thinking about you know, how important water was at that time in the middle of a drought, right? And just to pour, obviously, if you pour water on something, it's probably not going to catch fire, which was what it's supposed to do. So it was, in, in a way, it was challenging that, right? But at the same time, to, act, to be able to put on the altar even the most important things at that time, of that moment, you know, to be able to say, you know, I'll put it at the altar, even though this is what I need right now, you know, um, just to pour all that water on the altar, I, I, it's just there's a lot of that kind of stuff we see in, in Elijah's story so amen so that's yeah uh, no what I was going to say is that in our walk you know when it talks about the servants and it says you know you were faithful in the little over much I will put you you know like I will give you more like that's what Elijah was living it's like first he was he accepted that provision from ravens and this weirdness yeah, right yeah. And then the next thing, it's like, let me accept provision from this widow and let me perform, you know, let me f obey God and tell this woman to feed me and that God's going to provide, right? And you just see how it keeps increasing and increasing. But if we don't listen and obey, we're not going to see those miracles. And so it's very, like, confronting because many times, you know, we talk about, oh, Lord, I, I want you to use me. I, I, you know, we talk about the prophetic movement and stuff like that. But with those small little challenges that God gives us sometimes, whether it's call someone right now or how about you go give someone $10 or or sometimes it can be something so small where, you know, um, I think it's Beth Moore one day, God told her, say hi to the janitor mm -hmm. in, in the airport. And she's like, why? I'm busy. I'm not going to do this. And she she's like, hi. And she just said hi and like started a conversation. The woman that day was so depressed, was so sad, and because she acknowledged her, like she opened up and like she ended up praying for her, like basically, you know, just an, a miracle, right? And so it's so important for us to be tuned to the Spirit and to listen to Him because each time we're going to see greater and greater things, but we have to listen to those small things that God asks us to do, those things that don't make sense, things that don't seem right sometimes. Yeah. To and really. In the opposite way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times we may do things because they seem right, mm -hmm. even though it's not what the Spirit is telling you to do. It's not what God's telling you to do. And that's also dangerous, right? Because um, I remember one time I went upstairs leaving church. I was with my son, and um, some, some, a man came up to me, and he said, Hey, you know, I missed my bus. You know, I, I, um, I need to get home. And it was cold and stuff, you know. And I said, Oh, man, you know, I don't want my son to see me not help him. I can help him, you know. And so I gave him like 10 or 20 dollars, whatever I had, you know, it was, it, was, it was a good amount. And he said, thank you. And then as I was driving away, he went straight to the liquor store. <laughs> so um, I saw him, you know, I saw him that, you know, I, I kind of thought that he was drinking because he, he looked like he might be drinking, but I wasn't sure, you know, and, and I just felt like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give him this, you know, I want to show my son that you need to do the right thing, right? But then he went and he went just to get by more, more alcohol, you know, and... Um, and I showed my son, I actually said, you know, sometimes we do things because we think it's the right thing to do because we do it with our soul, you know, and we're like, oh man, you know, like a pastor has said it many times, right? You can find a prodigal son in need and give him a hot hamburger, right? Because you're not listening to God's spirit, you know, you're not listening to the spirit, right? And what's, what's that prodigal son going to do? He's going to stay there because you provided for his immediate need. He's not going to go back home because he thinks, you know, God provided for him. 
And, and it wasn't God, it was you. <laughs> right? Because in the reality, what God was giving him at that moment was hunger so that he'd go back home. Right? And, and, and that's really what the Elijah teaches us, right? To just listen to the Spirit. Even when it doesn't make sense. That's that widow. She doesn't have anything. Go ask her for food. You know? Say, seriously. You know, I, I would have... You have to just trust that God knows what He's doing when He tells you to do things. And that's how we need to live our lives. Amen? God bless you. God bless everybody. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for, um, for this time. Bless everybody here. And, and please, Lord, take everybody home safely. Uh, keep everybody safe, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. And we just remind everybody online, uh, worship night on the 26th at Saturday, uh, Saturday 26th at, at 6 p.m. here at church. Um, it's going to be Gen 14 gener Generation 14, Gen 14. Uh, kids are invited. Um, so kids are medical, school? Medical, uh, medical school, middle school, not medical school. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're invited too. So. God bless everybody.